morning, everyone. Uh, we are so happy to have you here with us. Uh, if this is your first time joining uh, Coffee with CF, of course, welcome to you. Uh, I am your host, Johnny Munoz, uh, and I'm the Engagement and Stewardship Manager for the Catholic Education Foundation of Los Angeles. Uh, the Catholic Education Foundation provides tuition awards to thousands of students every year, thanks to the tremendous and passionate support of our donors. As many of you have come to know, uh, we started this gathering uh, virtually an attempt to keep our partners, uh, our schools, and our students connected uh, through a very scary time uh, and to share uh, the many stories of perseverance and courage uh, we have all managed to obtain uh, over this past year. And so three seasons in, uh, this is our fourth episode, and uh, I would be totally remiss if I did not share that I have learned uh, so much and I continue to do so uh, at these sessions. And um, uh, I just thank you all for coming. Uh, week after week to make this initiative successful. So uh, I will no longer <laughs> belabor this monologue uh, and I'll jump right into covering a few housekeeping items uh, before we get underway. Um, first things first is uh, reminding everybody um, and suggesting that you uh, take a look at the top right hand corner of your screen and this is where you will be able to select the view uh, for today's session and so um, selecting speaker view is probably the best way to focus on whoever is speaking at that uh, specific time in the, in the, in the presentation, uh, but also gallery view is fun too because then you can see everyone who's on, on the call as well too. Um, as you may remember, we start with all microphones muted, and so, but with that said, we do encourage you to interact with our guests uh, by entering any questions you may have for them uh, into the chat feature and we will do our best to uh, address those as the show progresses on through. And lastly, if you have any sort of questions or need to reach out to us at any point in our program, uh, please do so uh, by uh, reaching out to Sandra. And so I have Sandra here uh, this morning uh, with us and she'll be working behind the scenes to make sure you're well taken care of. Uh, Sandra, could you please unmute and say hi to everyone? Yes, good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to be with you all. And if you have any questions, concern, technical difficulties, or um, want to send any kudos to our guests, um, please put them in the chat feature down below and I'll make sure to take care of that. Thanks, Sandra. I appreciate it. And so another thing that I'm excited about uh, is our commitment in starting each one of these episodes uh, with a moment of prayer. And so we are so happy um, and we feel so blessed to come together weekly. Uh, and so we will use the beginning of these sessions to, uh, to thank God for the opportunity he's given us uh, all to connect and, and to work um, in his name. So I invite you all to take a few seconds uh, to yourself and thank God for all he has done for you this morning uh, and continues to do uh, for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so this morning, we have the privilege of hearing from two of our assistant superintendents of Catholic schools, as well as two Catholic school administrators from one of our CEF elementary schools uh, out in the Santa Barbara pastoral region. Uh, we will be hearing an update on the reopening of Catholic schools throughout the Archdiocese of LA, which is super exciting. And we will also be receiving a firsthand account of what in-person learning has been like uh, and the steps they took in order to get a majority of their students uh, back onto their campus uh, as early as October of 2020. Uh, that's super, super exciting. And so we're, we're so happy to, to be able to hear um, their successes. <laughs> and so I am going to get over to this share screen one second. All right, I, I lost it. We need to make sure we got this uh, PowerPoint up. Uh, Sandra. Sorry for our technical difficulties this morning. Sandra, would you be able to grab that PowerPoint and share it from your screen possibly? Only because I wanna do them justice and show their wonderful faces. Um, and so if you can get that up by the time we're done with our intros, then that'll be nice so we can see everyone's faces, but we'll see them later in the episode too. Give me so. one second. Yeah, for sure. I'll start it and I'll pull it up. All right. And so our first guest today is Marissa May 
Carol, uh, she's the principal at Notre Dame School. Uh, Marissa is a product of Catholic school and she graduated from St. James School in Redondo Beach, California. Marissa remembers fondly her foundation of Catholic education and has a friend she met in kindergarten who is now the godfather of one of her children. Um, after attending public high school, where she was heavily involved in confirmation, uh, youth group, and lecturing at St. James, uh, Marissa returned to Catholic education at the University of Notre Dame, where she studied sociology, gender studies, and theology. Uh, she was also part of the diversity educators program for three years, as well as spent a summer as a house parent with Boys Hope, Girls Hope in New Orleans, and two summers as a counselor at a Catholic charities camp in upstate New York. Uh, she took a break from working with the youth and went to law school in Orange County. Um, Marissa worked in the legal field as the VP of operations for a national law firm in Santa Monica before coming back to a career in education. Um, she spent five years as the director of college counseling at Villanova Prep School in Ojai, California, as well as ran their summer leadership camp for middle school students for three years. Uh, since she has a background in college counseling, Marissa enjoys supporting a community where 60% of her students will be the first in their families to attend college. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Marissa. Next up, we have Sean Bayer. He's the whole child coordinator at Notre Dame School. Sean grew up in the summer camp in the summer camp and sports communities, uh, which is where he believes his path toward becoming a PE teacher began well before he even knew it. Uh, Sean's mother directed summer camps throughout his childhood, uh, which enabled him to work as a camp counselor and instill in him a love of working with children. Uh, eventually, Sean became a camp director for a traveling outdoor education program, taking students from Southern California schools all over the West Coast, uh, teaching leadership, uh, team building, and other important life skills. Uh, Sean directed and co-founded an outdoor education company in Eastern China that hosted nearly 3,000 Chinese and Mongolian students over the two summers uh, they ran the camp which is super outstanding. And currently, Sean is a sports and water sports summer camp director each year during the months of June, June through August. And Sean has been the PE teacher at Notre Dame School in Santa Barbara for a year and a half, teaching every class from preschool through eighth grade. Uh, most recently, Sean became whole child coordinator at Notre Dame in 2020, where he oversees and supports all extracurricular programs that encompass the whole child educational model. Sean, thank you so much uh, for all that you do at Notre Dame and for being with us this morning. Next up, we have Ryan Halverson, Assistant Superintendent for the Department of Catholic Schools. Ryan works directly with school and school leaders in the San Fernando region and across Los Angeles in the areas of finance, marketing, and development. Ryan has also taken the lead in interpretation of health guidance and school reopening procedures in this last year. Ryan has been in education for over 15 years as a teacher, coach, and principal before entering his current role. Ryan holds a master's in education administration from Cal State Northridge and a master's in education. He currently resides in Northridge, California with his wife, who is also a fellow Catholic school educator and their three children. Ryan, thanks for taking the time out of your busy day to be here with us. And lastly, I believe this was before we received her photo. So I'm so sorry if it's not up, uh, but Dr. Elizabeth Gregg, uh, she is also, yes, she got it, Never mind. She is the Assistant Superintendent for Department of Catholic Schools as well. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gregg works directly with school and school leaders in deaneries 13, 15, and 20, and across Los Angeles in the area of inclusion. Elizabeth has been working with Ryan in interpretation of health guidance and school reopening procedures in this last year as well. Elizabeth has been in education for over 20 years as a teacher, educational consultant, vice principal, and principal before entering her current role. Elizabeth holds a doctorate in educational leadership from Loyola Marymount University, a master's in education administration from Cal State Northridge, a master's in education with an emphasis in curriculum and instruction in technology from Grand Canyon University a multiple subject credential from San Francisco State, and she's currently enrolled at UCLA in the Leadership Support Program. Bravo, Dr. Greg, you, are, you have your hands full, that's for sure. Uh, Elizabeth uh, currently resides in Echo Park, California with her husband, Russ, and enjoys spending time with her large friend group who have recently moved from LA, or moved to LA from San Francisco, and with her large Irish family who live both in LA and Ireland. 
Amazing. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're so happy to have you, Dr. Greg. And so as we end the, sh the, the screen share, uh, I just want to say, wow, what a pleasure it is to have all of you on today's session. Uh, now, before we get started, uh, I would like to find out what each of you brought uh, to drink this morning. We had that conversation kind of going before we started, but uh, I'd love to have you now for the recording. Uh, Dr. Greg, what did you bring this morning to drink? Well, I, I brought a Starbucks today. I couldn't have my usual tiramia because I woke up too early at 3.30 in the morning. So it was closed when I, I went to go, but Starbucks was open at 5, so I got that. Yes. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much. And next up on the docket of finding out what we're drinking this morning is Ryan. Uh, Ryan, what did you what do you have this morning? Well, I no longer have it because I finished it. But um, I my my go to drink is uh, I get a double cappuccino. Oh, that's amazing. So that's double uh, double the amount of espresso, and then yep. still the, the the even amount of milk. Oh, that's good. That's right. That sounds tasty. Maybe I'll have that next. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Uh, and next up, Sean, uh, do you have something that you're drinking on this morning? Yes, I do, Johnny. I think I have the most cliche PE teacher drink of all time, a Coach Sean mug, mm. and it's actually a coffee-flavored protein shake with energy. So oh. it doesn't get, doesn't get more PE than that, but that's, that's where <laughs> yeah. I'm at today, Johnny. Oh, that's a cool a little mosaic of a beverage. I love that. It covers all the quadrants that you need. <laughs> that's too funny. Oh, man. Thank you so much for, uh, for bringing that and joining in on this fun little question. Uh, and lastly, uh, Marissa, what do you have to drink this morning? Yeah, I'm on my third cup of coffee, and it's always in my trusty Yeti mug because when I have to walk away for an hour and I forget my coffee, it's still hot when I come back. Yes. No spills, just all thrills, right? <laughs> That's awesome. That is way awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. That's sort of our quintessential icebreaker, and we love to hear uh, the stories behind your, your mugs, your coveted mugs, uh, maybe even where you got them, and also what fuels you to do the stuff that you do every day for our students and for your communities and for your, your individual teams. So that's always a fun personal question. So thank you. Uh, and so now we will just get the uh, show underway. Um, the first... Uh, sort of topic that I do want to cover is the reopening of schools. And so having an update, um, comprehensive, also well-developed because they have some slides for us this morning. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Greg and Ryan Halverson uh, to just go over a few points uh, and they've prepared a, a nice little uh, deck of slides for us as well. And so what I will do is sort of let you know where we're, we're uh, kind of curious and what we're wanting to know. And I'm sure you guys have covered all of it as well too. It's just some um, Starting off would be, what is the status uh, for the return of Catholic schools uh, to their in-person uh, instruction and having those kids on campus? Uh, and if you have you know, any stats um, that are very impactful and um, that, that, we, that you could share with us, uh, we all love numbers and we love to see the, the practical part <laughs> of these plans. And, so, and then you could just end off with just uh, maybe how you see the next three months panning out, um, especially for those seniors uh, that are hoping to graduate uh, with their fellow classmen. So I will now leave it to uh, Dr. Greg and Ryan and um, thank you so much. And I can't wait to, to see the, the slides. Great, well, right. well, thank you so much. It, it's so hard to believe that a year ago, this all started, we would never have imagined that our you know schools would have ever closed, that we wouldn't have been in person and we've come uh, such a long way since then with schools, uh, you know, in all kinds of, uh, some are in distance learning, some are in hybrid, some are in person. Um, but along the way, Ryan and I have definitely become involved in the adventure of trying to reopen schools uh, in all of the different counties with Ryan coming on board first, helping to open schools in Santa Barbara and Ben and then I joined the team as we moved into LA County. So it's been an interesting journey working with different health departments and working with different schools to get them um, to reopen. So I wanna share some of, uh, some of our, our slides, maybe Ryan, if you could put it on the first one of kind of what, where we're at and what it takes to reopen a school. So to reopen a school, there's some magic numbers that need to happen and the adjusted case rate is one of those numbers. 
So on February 16th, we reached one of the magic numbers, which was um, a case rate below 25 per 100,000 for five consecutive days. And what that allowed to happen was for our TK through six to go ahead and come back. And uh, last week, I think it was, we hit 12 so people could start to do sports. And now the magic number we are waiting for for grades seven to 12 is to get the case rate under seven per 100,000 for two consecutive weeks. And yesterday we hit 7.2, which shows that practice matter <laughs> because we <laughs> missed it. But that's okay. We think, you know, it might, it might push us forward a, another week, but um, we're certainly close at this time. So uh, maybe Ryan, next slide on there. Um, so there, there is some documents, of course, that schools have to submit to reopen, and it used to be called the waiver process, and Ryan and I uh, eat, drink, and <laughs> everything you can imagine uh, waivers about getting a waiver approved, but they have eliminated this waiver process now, and it is now a simpler process called the CSP, or COVID Safety Plan, and so if schools that want to reopen uh, they just need to email their COVID safety plan, which is um, a CPP, which is a uh, and which and a checklist into the county, and also post those on their website, and then they are able to open as long as they don't hear from the county um, after seven days. On the eighth day, they can open, and occasionally, sometimes on the seventh day at like 7 p.m., a school might get it get an email with some edits. So they just need to edit it and send it back in so that the, the kids can come back. Great, yeah, and, and, and obviously we, you know, Marissa was, was part of that early process, you know, it, on that last slide, Santa Barbara and Ventura, because their, their, their case rate was a lot lower at the time. And I will say that those two counties are a little, uh, more pro opening schools than LA County has been. Um, you know, Marissa and um, basically every Catholic elementary school we have in the Santa Barbara region uh, did open. There's six of them. And so I had the opportunity to go out and meet Marissa and do a site visit and, and answer some questions. So um, yeah, the Santa Barbara and Ventura schools were really on the, on the forefront of, of reopening. Um, so I think it's great that Marissa's on because she's had, you know, some schools in LA have only been open a couple of weeks and, you know, Marissa's been open for months. So she can certainly speak to that. Um, so glad to see that she's on. Um, I wanted to share some results. We, we recently did a, a uh, system-wide uh, survey. The survey was mostly for our, our LA County schools, but we did take uh, data and include Santa Barbara and Ventura schools. Um, basically, we we know that uh, most of them are open, so we kind of just incorporated that data we already had, but this will give you a, a systemic look at where our, our system of 205 elementary schools are at in, in the reopening process. So, so the good thing is, is of this data, we had 195 schools either respond or be included in this data, which is a 95% response rate. And like I said, it includes, you know, schools like Marissa's out in Santa Barbara and Ventura. So we, we kind of were looking at different grade bands. Um, and, and the reason being is the, the older the students, the, the more challenges sometimes there are to bring in the back, or if we're talking LA, the more restrictions there are. So, you know, for schools that have preschools, they've been allowed to be open basically this whole time. Most of our schools do not have preschools, but of those that do, 76% um, of those are currently open. Another 4% are planning to open by March 15th. And then another 20% um, currently do not have uh, a set date for a return. Um, there's various reasons for that. Some of them, uh, they've surveyed their parents and their parents are not comfortable returning yet. Or in some cases, um, I know we had some preschools where distance learning was really a challenge for that age group. Um, and, and some of them currently suspended preschool operations completely um, because of that. Uh, the next grade band we looked at was TK through two. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, the waiver process in, in LA County was a lot different than Santa Barbara and Ventura. The waivers in LA only allowed schools to return up to second grade. Um, so you're gonna notice that we have more schools back in this grade level than, than the third through sixth grade band because of that. 
So 43.6% uh, of our schools are back on campus in this grade band and, and in our system. Uh, another 26% will be back uh, in the next two weeks. Another 17.5% after that, and about 16.6% currently do not have a set date for return. Um, Elizabeth's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, a lot of the schools that do not have a set date, again, it's a variation. It could be that they have a high percentage of their community that does not want to return. Um, a lot of these schools are in areas of LA where the, the COVID infection rate is still very high. So we're talking downtown, um, East LA, those pockets of LA. Um, and, then, and then also a, a concern about um, wanting teachers to be vaccinated before they uh, are able to return. And so we're going to speak a little bit more to that um, on our last slide. And then the last one is third through six. So obviously these numbers are going to be a little bit lower. Um, and that's because this just recently opened um, uh, February 16th. And so we've had schools slowly start to open these, these uh, grade levels up to sixth grade. So 20% of our schools in, uh, in our archdiocese are open. And on campus, 41%, which is a pretty good chunk coming up in the next two weeks, will be back on campus. Another 22% are going to return after March 15th, and currently about 16% have no set date for return. And again, those same kind of challenges, parents not wanting to return at this time, high COVID rates or concerns about wanting teachers vaccinated before uh, they re return to campus. And so speaking of vaccines, the last thing we wanted to share is where we're at um, with that. And in, we have uh, a certain slide, but then Elizabeth also has some exciting new news that we'd like to share with everybody on the vaccine front. So uh, like Ryan said, really a school reopening, there's so many factors that go into that and you know why it's so unique for each school. Like teachers, uh, you know, teachers need to be on board with coming back. The parent community has to be on board with coming back. You have to have the PPE equipment in place. What is the COVID rate? Uh, in the area, the school's in a high COVID rate and the, the teachers and, and parents, um, you know, are, are scared to go back. That's, that's a very legitimate thing. And of course, vaccinations are all the, the hot news right now. Like who has, a, who has the hot ticket? Who has a vaccine? Who doesn't have a vaccine? And so, and what, what is DCS doing about it to, to help uh, get, our, get our teachers and our employees in our schools vaccinated? So DCS is working with the various county public health departments and the county offices of education who are coordinating with the state's Department of Public Health on the distribution of vaccine appointments. And so many uh, of our schools have been able to get employees uh, vaccinated that way. Uh, you know, certain uh, health uh, departments of public health, you know, Long Beach, for instance, was fantastic. They were right at the forefront and know got our teachers in Long Beach um, vaccinated but it's not always so simple um, especially in a big county uh, like Los Angeles County. So we did get exciting um, news yesterday. Um, our superintendent Paul Escala has been working with um, LMU to try to secure some appointments for our sites and that was able um, was able to happen so we have Ryan and I sort of, you know, we, we aren't wearing the waiver hat as much anymore, but we're, we've kind of become the, the vaccine team, <laughs> the emergency <laughs> response team. So it, it's been um, kind of a, you know, a joy this morning, um, you know, being able to reach out to schools. And we, we really are prioritizing schools that are in areas with the highest uh, COVID rate. Um, and uh, schools were, you know, within two miles of the school, um, poverty, uh, you know, poverty is high, income levels um, are low, and really reaching out to those um, communities first, and then also prioritizing, you know, schools are, are open as, uh, as well with, you know, teachers back and students back, but, but especially in, in those areas that most need it. How amazing. Well, oh, I would say whether, I guess, whether you are confident or concerned, 
I think this in itself uh, is such a big movement and such a big feat uh, for in the span of 12 months to go through everything that we've gone through and to have to try to coordinate with so many families uh, within each school. And then obviously over 200 schools is uh that's, that's a large task. <laughs> and it seems like you guys have been working day and night, burning the midnight oil on that. And it seems like we're, we're starting to get to a place where uh, we can give our students that quality education they deserve. Um, and so that's, that's exciting news uh, in, in, in itself. And so thanks for all of your hard work. Um, thanks for this time that, that you gave us as well too. Wonderful slides. Uh, we do love the numbers. Uh, I can speak for myself at least, but yeah, that, that really brings in a lot of uh, um, insight and some just um, concrete information, which is good because I didn't know uh, a lot of this stuff was happening. To hear the number of schools that are, are already back or in the next two weeks are coming back is, um, oh, that's big news. And so, so I'm glad you guys were able to share that with us. So thanks, uh, Ryan, and thanks, uh, Dr. Greg. I do invite you to continue to stay on. We have like a Q&A element of these uh, sessions as well too. So if any of our uh, attendees have any questions for you, we encourage you uh, to type them in uh, for our guests and uh, we will try to address those as well too, okay? Uh, so thanks so much for that. That was very, very helpful. And I'm gonna swing on over and, and move the conversation to our school in Santa Barbara. And so when I heard uh, as early as August, and the majority of them in October, I was like, wow, that, that is a huge thing. And so first it's, it's an applause. Uh, and then also, then, then, then comes the thinking, right? How did this even happen? This is amazing. We need to get them on. Uh, and so that's, that's the first thing. So uh, Marissa and or Sean, however you guys would like to do this. Uh, the first question is, if you could just paint a picture for us of the Notre Dame's journey uh, and, and how that came to life uh, to get your students back to school. Sure. Well, I think my journey started on July 6th when I had a baby. So uh, Notre Dame's journey really did start with Sean. So I'm going to let him okay. gonna talk about what we did in July and then segue yes. into August. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned how we started in August, but actually, if for us, it kind of started in July. Um, as you guys heard in our bios, Marissa and I have kind of a, a vast camp ex past and experience so so we kind of were brainstorming before she was leaving uh with having a baby to kind of come up with a way to control the unknown how could we how can we have a test trial to uh kind of see how this is going to roll out so what we had the idea of is having a summer camp uh, mm -hmm. a, COVID, a COVID protocol summer camp where yeah. we would just have about six students that were, you know, had families that were willing to send their kids to uh, our yard. And we had about two staff per student. And we kind of ran it like a summer camp uh, just to kind of see what, what would be possible, what games right. would be possible, what protocols would be possible, uh, uh, cleaning, so many different things. So so through that summer camp, we were able to kind of get a lot of feedback about on a smaller scale, how this is going to work, mm -hmm. how we're going to have to roll this out in a much bigger scale. And I think that was like a, a it was really cool that Marissa, you know, kind of allowed me to kind of run with that. And, and it, I think it really ended up helping us a lot. And that kind of segued into what we did do on a much larger scale. Yeah, oh, man. I, that's great. I would say that um, it, for principals out there who are, you know, jumping into this, finding who your allies are uh, in your staff that you can kind of say, okay, I'm going to try this. And to Sean really is like a rally for me, like, okay, sure, we can do it. And then when I promote, when I say it to the staff, he's like, great, you know, so in public, we might have a a back channel conversation where we iron it out first, but then when it rolls out to the staff, you know, he's super into it. Um, and so based on the data that we got from doing the summer camp, I was able to meet with our preschool director and she, she saw that it worked. You know, we had students from young all the way up to seventh and eighth grade who participated in this camp. 
And so when she saw that it was possible, that made her feel a little more comfortable that our preschool could come back in person. So the preschoolers were back in person August 26th, and I worked with her to write the plan for state licensing because we are a state licensed preschool. She had to submit you know, all the protocols. So, so me starting our journey of writing our waiver really started with her writing the protocol plan for the state um, the state protocols for her preschool. Okay. The other thing that was really nice is our preschool families, many of them have siblings that are in the older grades. So while in the midst of working with uh, Ryan and, and drafting, starting to draft this, this waiver process, the older sibling, the parents of these older siblings were seeing our practices in place. And again, starting to build, I was starting to build another ally base of parents. Um, you know, these parents saw, okay, if my preschooler can do it, then my fifth grader can definitely wear a mask all day. You know, if my preschooler can keep six feet apart and not run up and hug the teacher, my fifth grader can do it. Um, so September 1st, we submitted our waiver, pro, our waiver application. It went through a couple iterations. Um, Ryan was very instrumental. He came out and, you know, saw what we were doing. And on September 18th, we were approved. Um, and we actually, though, did not come back in person until October 1st. So we could, we were allowed to start on September 18th, but we needed to transform our campus. <laughs> so we, we have a very old building. Um, and at the time, the, the guidance that was released for, for COVID really recommended, you know, being outside or outside being the safest space. And our building is, um, doesn't have the best airflow. And I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous. And I think a lot of our parents were a little nervous bringing back everybody inside, you know, having all 132 students inside our building. So we, I went to Sean and I said, okay, can we do like, let's pull this camp thing again. And can we do something outside? Um, so Sean, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about, about what we did, but I'll share the pictures that we have. Sure. Yeah, this is where this is where it got fun for sure. We <laughs> we have like we have a decent sized yard, but compared to a lot of campuses, it's not that large. So we definitely wanted to make spaces spread out enough to where the classes aren't disturbing each other, and then they also have their own cohort play areas. Um, but we also needed it in correct shade spots to avoid winds, which became a big factor, which I'll touch on. But so as you can see in some of these photos that oh, wow. I built these uh, big tent clusters and used everything from sandbags, cinder blocks, zip ties, ropes, tie downs, everything you could think of. I used benches, I just tied it to anything, playgrounds uh, to really secure these and to give them their own space. Um, and then within those areas, we also uh, staked off and caution taped off their play areas. So that's mm -hmm. spread out so that the cohorts would never mix in the case of, you know, a case. Um, and then each, each area also had its own, or it still does have their own uh, garage kind of laundry sink that we split and ran hoses all over the yard. And so that way the students aren't even sharing sinks and then there's dots and lines everywhere for the spacing but but the, the the mother nature aspect has definitely been our biggest hurdle in that sense of the journey as you'll see right right here and the the tough part about it was mother nature was really not on our side so much that we've had these winds this year that i'm sure you guys have felt as well that i personally haven't seen in years if ever some of the largest gusts we've ever had and they always seem to happen over the weekend when we're not here so you know <laughs> right stop it so we'd come in over on monday and all the work that we had done is literally in shambles non-fixable and so i i tried many times to patch work and i would save old parts of tents to repair the tents that could be repaired so it was just any and every way we could keep this going and not send the kids home we were doing and that touches on and i'll get on to, into that more but the just the resiliency of the kids that they'd come and be okay we're in a different spot this week all right let's do it at least we're here so 
So this journey uh, with the, the classrooms has been very up and down, but nothing has stopped us. And that we, that's what uh, I love about uh, Marissa and this community we have here is everybody's just ready to keep rolling and nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna send us home. That's kind of the uh-huh. mentality we have. I just want to clap to that. That's amazing. I, I feel like it, where can we find more Sean's? Right? It seems like every school needs a Sean <laughs> to just get, I mean, you, you, you listed all these supplies, like cinder blocks, tie downs, like I mean, from what I can only imagine. And hopefully you guys can clear, uh, clarify is the fact that these were not probably like cookie cutter, like diagrams that you get when you like, you're, you know, assembling a table or something. It's not like all Catholic schools do this, do this, five easy ups, a sink. I mean, you guys on an individual basis have to come up with this stuff. Like this is so creative and it just shows how much heart and passion you have because it's like, there's nothing going to stop us. We have to start on Monday. The kids will be here. So let's get to get to work. And so amazing, Sean. I mean, that's just, that's the first part of this conversation. Uh, you, you and the rest of your team, um, as we say, like it takes a village and, and you guys, whether the village is big or small, you, you have to get it done. And so that's amazing. And those pictures really brought that to life. And we have a guest, uh, an attendee that was on, or that is on right now. And she says, wow, these guys are so creative. And so uh, kudos, that's, that's a huge kudos that I will give on behalf of everyone else too. So that's amazing. Great, great job. And so the next thing is, um, I guess, let's see, is there a threshold uh, or maybe like a protocol uh, when there is exposure to COVID-19? Uh, what do you guys have to do as a school? I hear that they're in cohort. So if you could just you know, fill us in a little bit on that, if that happens and if it has happened, let us know too. Yeah, so you know, the pictures that we showed were really a lot of them, most of them from before Christmas break. Uh, we did exclusively outdoor through Christmas break Uh, After Christmas break, we did a two week, everyone online, then we came back. And again, mother nature, you know, we were contending with her. So we actually, uh, towards the end of January, we brought a couple of cohorts inside. Um, And I will say that Ryan, when he first came to see us said, you know, it is possible, Marissa, you could be inside. And, you know, at the time I was not super keen on that, but then, you know, regulations changed and um, guidance changed and, really my families became a little more comfortable of of being inside. So, but that brings more challenges in terms of the movement, you know, through campus and through the building. So we have a couple of cohorts that are outside, um, but I have to admit, we actually do have two cohorts right now today who are online because there was a a COVID positive case in the cohorts. Um, And so we're very flexible. Uh, we've had a couple of cases. Our first case that entered our community was over Thanksgiving. So the, the case was notified, we were notified over Thanksgiving, but because the person really had not been around campus, it didn't really affect the student experience and, and nothing really needed to be shared. Um, but then once we came back into the in-person learning after Christmas break, We've had a few, and um, as you may or may not know, the law changed, so we had to start notifying, you know, our faculty and staff whenever there was a case, and Sean will know that, you know, since I went to law school, I'm very <laughs> litigious in that sense, so, you know, we're, they're getting these memos, and even if it's not necessarily a case, sometimes if it's just a parent, and they were never on campus, but their child was, you know, I'll notify them just to, to let everyone know that it's happening in our community. Um, But when there is a COVID positive case of a student or staff, we send the students online. Um, And we work with the Santa Barbara County Public Health and our liaison. Susan is excellent. She really gives us guidance on what to do, what what to follow, and um, notifications. And they've sent out templates on how to notify. And then our archdiocese is very supportive as well. We report when there's a case. And I get a call from legal and you know they just kind of walk me through what to do and we because of all of this our community has become very flexible you know they can be online they can be in person the teacher can be there in person or the teacher can be teaching from home and the kids are sitting in the classroom and viewing on zoom we even have a cohort where the teacher they're split in two into two different classrooms and the teacher is teaching live in one classroom and the kids next door are zooming into that lesson. And the kids at home are also zooming in. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. 
I mean, that was a question I would think we had when we were preparing this is like, what do the classrooms even look like? Uh, and wow, that's, that's, that's a way to do it. You know, there's, there's no stopping that. And um, I guess, I don't know, is there, you guys have been back enough as far as time uh, or maybe not, uh, I would just assume, um, is there, I guess, could you speak on any effects that you've seen uh, on the kids uh, since being back whether that be spiritually, uh, you know, their emotions or um, just, just in general, like how has this uh, affected the, the students? Uh, and what are some of the ways that your team, <clears throat> sorry, has developed some of the instruction in order to sort of make up for lost time? Um, is there any stories that you guys can see uh, and tell us uh, in that sense? Yeah, I think I'll let Sean, because he sees all the kids, you know, preschool through eight. So he, he knows firsthand. Yeah, yeah sure. definitely. Uh, I think I definitely have the best vantage point because I'm, I think, the only staff member that does interact every day pretty much with every single student. Um, so, and I kind of briefly mentioned it before, the just resiliency of these kids. It, it's just so incredible because I was so nervous, I guess you could say, about this whole scenario and how it was going to affect them. Like, I knew I could handle it. I knew Marissa could handle it. But if, if it was going to you know, affect them, it's not going to work. Um, but they were just, uh, right off the bat, so happy to be back, number one. But that also was, and somewhat still is, a little, but they're so much better, um, kind of the problem. They're so happy and excited, and they're kids, and they want to just be together. And if I had you know, a dollar for every time I heard a staff member say, six feet, six feet, like <laughs> we would... Uh, have a much bigger school. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so these kids, and, and something interesting that I was talking to Marissa about this morning is not only do I see these kids, you know, in the cla my classes, but from my, my classroom, which is outdoors, now I see what most PE teachers have never really seen to this extent is I see inside every single classroom all day, every day. Mm -hmm. So I see how they are there as well and again i'm just so impressed um with our community and these kids and how how i think our staff has definitely been a such a huge part of making it feel so comfortable for these kids um even though they are outside it might be cold in the morning so our staff is so flexible in that sense too that if it's cold let's go walk around the field real quick you know let's let's do anything we can to make this the most comfortable experience for these kids so they have you know a comfortable space to learn um and it's that's just been the most impressive part to me is how much they shocked me in that way no, no, and I'm sure it's going to be something that all schools eventually will have to deal with is, 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 is sort of tending to each student, um, having to deal as a student with like, uh, can't, you know, be that close with your friends and you have to stay apart. It's something they've never known. And so how do they even deal with this being at school, their focus? And, and I'm sure that's going to be something that, that just continually cultivates. And um, wow. I mean, this past year, we brought a new name to like what homeschooling is and everybody had to do it now. And now also, it seems like as we go back to school, even school is going to have to look and feel totally different too, at least, you know, for, for, for the beginning. And so um, I'm so glad that you guys are on the for forefront of that. And so I'm going to go to, to a, um, a, an audience, I guess, or an attendee uh, sort of question that we have uh, on the call today too. And, and so we have um, one of the principals at one of our other schools, Tina Johnson, she says, what advice uh, do you have for teachers who are working with students face-to-face -face, as well as those continuing uh, in the digital learning environment? If there's anything that you, you maybe could share with us. Well, I think really it's about being willing to take risks and being willing, to, quite honestly, to fail um, and not being afraid of that word. I mean, Sean and I, we showed you those pictures coming on a Monday and seeing tents just obliterated at seven o'clock, knowing that kids are gonna walk through the gate at 7.30. I mean, that changes you, <laughs> you know? So being, being willing to try something new, you know, the, the situation we have with a teacher who's zooming in and teaching next door, when she brought that first to me, I said, I don't know if that's gonna work, you know? And, but she pushed me and she said, no, I can do it. And, and then she tried it and it worked. And we have other teachers who saw that and said, absolutely, I will never do that. 
and they don't have to, and they're utilizing Google Classroom and Squarespace and or other ways, you know, to seesaw and things like that to um, connect with their teachers. The other thing too is we've really empowered our teacher, uh, our teacher aides, our support staff, to really come into the classroom and do as much as they possibly can for the students. And it has forged a relationship between teachers and support staff that we have not seen before. Um, so really utilize all of the supports that you have, all of the resources that you have, and be be creative. You know, be willing to take those risks. Absolutely. No, that, that's that's great advice. And I hope that that did help um, Tina and anyone else who's on the call and anyone else who watches this as well, too, that that ode to uh, to confidence and just having the, the courage to just try it all uh, and, and, and know that ebbs and flows will come. Uh, and it seems like we'll be in a valley for a bit, but, but we're on the way you know, to that peak. And so I'm so glad that you have been the brave ones to do this and to kind of show us. And I'm sure a lot of people will be reaching out to you to say, hey, how did you do this? And how'd you do that? And so um, we seem to never have enough time here, uh, but we're in our last 10 minutes. I do want to, I not saying that this particularly is the, the way it happened, but I know this helps out a lot and so I would like to hear a little bit about um, the Audacious Foundation and their role they've played with you uh, getting your students back here and, and even you know organizations of the like as well too but uh, can you speak to sort of that that help that you guys have received through the Audacious Foundation? Sure I think the very first step Audacious had is um, they asked me how can we get students back on campus as soon as possible even if that just means an hour a day or 30 minutes um, so they empowered Sean and I to brainstorm about an after school movement time that would take place when we were still in the digital space. So Sean, I mean, if you could just share about what you thought to bring to that, that hour or half hour that the students had. Yeah, definitely. This is, uh, this is where I could get going and talk too much. So stop me <laughs> if I do, uh, because this is when I was, I got fired up when Audacious was willing to, you know, fund some, you know any any pretty much anything that we had that we thought would work and one of the biggest things uh surprisingly ended up being our bicycle program that we started so we had these bikes in the basement that that were kind of collecting dust in a way because they were so hard to get out and we had the idea in this after school you know movement time program how can we do this safely in the beginning how can we get them moving how can we get them here how can we how could we offer something to these families that would want these kids to come and we're like, do we have bikes? Like, and so we, we, Marissa gave me the freedom to, to, you know, kind of have ideas and offer them out. And then Audacious was able to fund a shed. So I built the shed. I spent about three weeks in, over the summer with just <laughs> out there in the sun, just going <laughs> at it. And we built this big shed that fits all the bikes. So we were able to start this bike program that eventually even led into audacious funding other bike programs now that we're in person. So we have a relationship with a company here now in Santa Barbara that helps us donate smaller bikes when we need them. They send volunteers when we need them for our bike classes during PE or after school. And we have a uh, traveling company, Wilderness Youth, that kind of takes our kids to the beach now and to parks and they get to learn how to ride on the streets. And it's just a mo another way that they can Kind of grow and it's a part of our enrichment hold child program that you know can offer so much more to these kids that others unfortunately aren't getting right now but that is still safe and follows all these kind of protocols and audacious has just been crucial and i couldn't appreciate them more Oh, that's amazing. And, and so we've, we've come to know them just in the past few months too. And so we're so happy to be able to partner with them and, and to now have you serendipitously on this call and, and know that they've connected with you guys as well too. It's, it's really helping us in a time of need. And so thank you Audacious Foundation uh, for everything you do for these schools that are uh, back in school and on campus, uh, especially uh, Notre Dame as well too. So how, what, a, what, what great Great news, knowing that the spring is on its way in summer and, and it seems like all that, you know, the wilderness and, and the bikes together and getting them out outside of the classroom. You talk about when they're cold, moving around. I mean, this is going to be a new season now uh, for in, uh, in-person instruction for you that uh, are at school and in school now. So congrats on that, on that front. And so I will ask one last question just to wrap it up and then we'll have a few announcements. So if you guys can stay even a, a couple minutes afterwards, we would love it. Um, but I, I do know 
um, that there is sort of this stigma to, to Santa Barbara area, the, the American Riviera. Uh, what would both of you say, or I guess better said, how would you enlighten someone um, who references that common misperception that uh, maybe there's not enough, there's not a lot of need out there in Santa Barbara? What, how would you guys approach something like that? Well, I would definitely say that when I, coming from growing up in Torrance and Redondo Beach, I shared that. You know, hearing about Santa Barbara up north and thinking it was all like Oprah, you know, and kind of people who live in Montecito. Um, and, but I have to say the reality of our school is we have 48 students who are CEF uh, recipients this year. Um, so for those who don't, might not know, they're the free reduced lunch eligible kind of guidelines. Um, and with additional endowments that we have specific to San, to Santa Barbara, we actually have over 80 students who are receiving financial assistance from CEF and Catholic education would not be possible for them without that. Um, and Father Cesar, my pastor, I have to shout him out. You know, he's at Our Lady of Sorrows, and he always says we serve a downtown population, and we use downtown in the same way that the connotation of downtown in any major city is used. Um, mm -hmm. We have students here, like mentioned earlier, 60% of them will be the first in their family to go to college. Many of our families were hit very hard by COVID because they are in the service industry. So they work as, you know, your chefs, your house cleaners, um, and so they were directly affected by, you know, the pandemic. And so that was an additional hardship for them. You know, they are already sacrificing an incredible amount to make Catholic education possible for their children uh, to change their lives you know, and their family for generations to come. Uh, so that's what I would say. I think Sean also has a, a little different perspective. Yeah, mine, mine was, I mean, similar and different because I also had a preconceived kind of misconception and I only grew up in Ventura County. So I'm really close, but I still looked at it, you know, as Santa Barbara up here. And uh, when I started working with my traveling camp, we, we started working with schools from t cities kind of just around Santa Barbara. And these were, you know, uh, schools that you wouldn't think of when you think Santa Barbara. And that's when I started kind of, opening my eyes that every kind of community has these type of, you know, uh, communities within them. And then when I started working here, which is in the heart of cliche Santa Barbara, and we still have this kind of community, it was uh, really eye opening. And I did mention this immersive too. It made me, you know, have an even more uh, appreciation for the Catholic community and the Catholic school community because they, you know, find these corners of these communities and help and offer them this kind of education and experience. And uh, it just, it just uh, really made me appreciate all that a lot more. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your guys' heart and, and, and all that you have done in this past year, if not, you know, only nine months uh, worth of time. And so, Congratulations. Thanks for serving uh, the underserved. Uh, thanks for being here at any cost after, you know, catastrophes of Mother Earth and <laughs> anything that you could think of. You guys have certainly jumped over every hurdle that's been put in your way. And so we appreciate you uh, sharing those stories with us. Uh, this gives us uh, that that rally that you said too. It, this sort of is rallying us to, to go get out there and to continue to do what we do because every family uh, is deserving of, of a Catholic education and, and just of help. So uh, I'm so such an honor to have you all on this call today. And so I'm going to jump over to a few announcements. And um, yeah, I just want to say uh, one last thank you to each person uh, uh, who, who joined us today in our audience. And then also for our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Greg, Ryan, thank you so much for, for that update. Uh, and we look forward to uh, having uh, some more openings and some uh, some brighter lights uh, ahead of us. So, uh, and Marissa and Sean, wow, great work. Thanks for being here with us today. Um, and so I will like to take this moment as well to um, just give a, a big thanks to all uh, of the Catholic schools across the Archdiocese uh, of LA uh, for their dedicated work in their specific schools and for uh, consistently being there for their students, especially during this time. So uh, if this episode has touched your hearts and, and you feel that you can give right now, uh, please visit our website at uh, cefdn.org. And do remember that 100% of your contribution and your donation goes straight to uh, the tuition awards to help those families um, bridge that gap between what they uh, can afford and, and what tuition costs are. And so, 
If you can, that would be awesome. And if you'd like to learn more about the Department of Catholic Schools at the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, and also if you'd like to learn more about Notre Dame School, um, you can visit both of them uh, at both of their websites. Uh, first, we'll talk of the DCS, which is catholiced.com. Um, any questions you may have for Dr. Greg, um, Mr. Halverson, or the rest of the team on, on things to come, uh, please visit them there. It's a wonderful website, very uh, intuitive and easy to navigate. And so uh, same with Notre Dame School, beautiful website. And so if you'd like to reach out to uh, Sean and Marissa in any sort of ways, uh, they have fresh photos up there of, of what life is right now. And, and it's super helpful. So um, that website is uh, www.notredamesb.org. So if you uh, would like to get information on their school and their happenings, please visit them there. Um, we wish them all the best luck. Uh, and before we close out this morning, uh, I just want to let you all know that Coffee with Siva will be taking a short break next Wednesday, uh, do some, some uh, spring cleaning as this winter season finishes, uh, and we'll get ramped up for uh, our next episode. And so we will return to action March 17th uh, at 10 a.m. And so we're blessed to have recent CEF graduates from the class of 2020 who have just started their freshman year of college uh, in a virtual world. So we're going to be hearing of their experiences, their thoughts, and their reflections on a, a year like none other. And so one of those uh, schools, the, the president is on the call today too. So Martin, you, you'll be able to hear from him in two weeks time too. So please remember to RSVP uh, for that March 17th episode, not next week, uh, but in two weeks uh, on our website, just as you did for this episode uh, at cefdn.org uh, forward slash coffee with CEF. And that concludes our episode for today, uh, but we hope to see you next week. And we're so happy that you joined us this week. And um, like always, God bless and happy Wednesday, everyone. Please unmute, uh, give thanks to, to our guests. And if you want to say anything, but thanks everyone for, for being with us this morning. Appreciate it.